this is not just a story about one minority in China. This is a story about humanity. You know, this is a story about what happens when we put、um, bad technologies in the hands of bad people who have bad intentions. Hi, I'm Taylor Owen, and this is Big Tech. The plight of the Uyghurs is one of those stories that's never really left the news cycle, but still somehow hasn't fully captured the attention it warrants. Maybe this is because it's notoriously difficult to do investigative journalism in China, or maybe it's because Western business interests are so entrenched there, or maybe it's because, unlike past atrocities, images of violence aren't filling our screens. Whatever the case. We're certainly not paying enough attention to what the people of Xinjiang call the situation, the largest internment of an ethnic minority since the Holocaust. Something the U.S. State Department and a number of international human rights organizations have called a genocide. If you're looking for a primer on this situation, look no further than Jeffrey Kane. Jeffrey spent three years interviewing Uyghur refugees, Chinese tech workers, and government officials. And the resulting book, *The Perfect Police State*, is a window into an Orwellian dystopia. His depictions of the Chinese police state are eerily similar to descriptions of Nazi Germany or Stalin's Soviet Union, with one obvious difference: this might be the first genocide in history that's been enabled by big data and by artificial intelligence. Like my previous episode with Han Shen. This conversation should be seen as a component of the wider, complex political economy of Chinese technology. Hong made the argument that the Chinese firewall allowed Chinese tech giants to become the economic powerhouses they are today. Jeffrey focuses on the other side of these companies' growth. He shows how they help build a sophisticated surveillance state, capable of monitoring and shaping the behavior of hundreds of millions of Chinese citizens. And this model is now being exported to liberal-leaning countries around the world, which means that the dystopian reality that the Uyghurs are living in is not just a human rights atrocity; it also presents real challenges to democracy itself. Here's Jeffrey Kane. In Xinjiang, they talk about the surveillance state that was built as the situation. How would you sort of just very generally and broadly characterize? Uh, this situation. So the situation has arisen out of、uh, what you could say is China's war on terror.、Um, so throughout the 2000s and the early 2010s, there was a span of about 15 years when there was both、um, growing inequality and discontent within the region of Xinjiang. It was this frontier of China where the Han Chinese, the dominant group, would be bussed out, and with the encouragement of the government, they would. Um, you know, develop the region, build high rises. You know, look for new jobs, find oil, build the railways. It really did have that that gold rush sense to it that this was going to be、uh, the future. But you know, in the process, many、uh, local Uyghurs and Kazakh Muslim peoples were displaced from their historical homeland. They they couldn't get jobs. There was a discrimination, and、um, this this two class society emerged in which you know either you are the majority Han Chinese or you are the minority、uh, Muslim. Uh, Uyghurs or another ethnic group there. I mean, this is you know this is not、uh, necessarily unique to China. This has echoes of you know what happened in, in the American West with the Manifest Destiny, the removal of Native Americans from their lands.、Um, you know, the South Africa with apartheid. But what makes Xinjiang unique and different from these examples、um, is that China has innovated a 21st century form of apartheid. Based on novel technologies、uh, such as AI and facial recognition,、um, big data gathering, surveillance cameras, so all of this data, the, the Uyghur people in Xinjiang are being monitored twenty four seven. Data is being scooped up on them,、uh, you know, sent back to the police, sent back to the intelligence, the party、uh, headquarters in the region,、um, and there is an artificial intelligence system that processes all this data. It's called the IJOP or the Integrated Joint Operations Platform. It is、um, a system that,、uh, you know, through a mixture of just 
data gathered on everyone determines if they are at risk of committing a crime in the future. So, you know, this is pre-crime. If this AI system determines them to be a, a future threat, um, they the, the police are sent in and a weaker person will be taken away to a concentration camp for a future crime that she or he will commit. Um, so in esti- the, the latest estimates are somewhere between maybe 300 and 800. There are at least 350 documented camps um, you know, up in the mountains of the region. They're often repurposed high schools or government buildings, gymnasiums. Uh, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, every single day from, you know, from early morning to late at night, um, the Uyghur people in these camps undergo a, a never-ending series of brainwashing and indoctrination rituals in which they're, they're psychologically tortured, forced to deny their own realities. And the effect all this has is that it, the goal is erasing the identity of a people, just simply, you know, doing a, an identity wipe. They forget who they are. They deny their own history and heritage and culture. They're no longer Muslim. They're no longer Uyghurs. Um, they're simply going to take in the propaganda of the state and become minions of the state. That's the end goal of this. And it, it is surprisingly effective. Um, you know, all of all the Uyghur refugees I interviewed, uh, who had either been in camps or had family members in camps or friends, um, you know, they, they almost all of them remarked that the people who were in these camps um, were like these uh, am- these car crash patients who woke up with amnesia and they didn't know who they were, where they kind of came from. It was just simply a blank slate. I want to get into some of the details of how that that experience, but also the how it's being operationalized. Um, but you do write a bit about some of the rationale for this. Uh, so just just to give that context, I mean, it seems like it was put in place after 9-11, um, perhaps opportunistically, thinking that there was like a moment where counterterrorism could be used as a justification for all sorts of things, um, and not just by China. Other gov- governments have done that too, obviously. But it, to what degree is this a counterterrorism narrative? Is there any truth to that? Uh, yeah, it, so it is a counterterrorism narrative, actually. I think that there is a great truth to that. And um, so so just to give some historical background, um, you know, under the Communist Party in particular, the Chinese authorities always looked at the Uyghurs and Xinjiang with suspicion. It was a potential breakaway state. It was its own um, unique culture, language, history that was separate from other parts of China. So uh, the authorities were always concerned about separatism, but it wasn't really until 9-11 with the Twin Towers uh, that China started kicking up the rhetoric and the intense repression on the basis of uh, counterterrorism operations. So, um, it, it, you know, and actually the, the U.S. government has some uh, culpability in, in helping create the, the situation there, um, because at Guantanamo Bay, there were uh, 22 Uyghur captives. They're called the uh, the Uyghur 22 and uh, the, the U.S. had, you know, brought them, had captured them in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, they were combatants to some extent, but there was really not much evidence that, um, you know, these individuals were, you know, setting up uh, an actual jihad that they were going to wage against, you know, liberal democracy and its its forces. But the fact that these people were in Guantanamo, um, there was no charge brought against them, like all Guantanamo prisoners. Uh, th- this was a huge boon for what China was trying to do, because now it had the evidence, like, look, they're in Guantanamo. They must be terrorists. They must yeah. be terrorists. And see, Amer- America supports us too. Uh, we we in China, you know, we have this Uyghur threat and we have to take action. And this laid the groundwork for the justification and the rhetoric of what would, you know, later become the situation in Xinjiang. Yeah. Wow. I mean, you think of the long-term repercussions of that global war on terrorism framing. And man, this is a visceral one, isn't it? For most of the book, you follow um, a single person, um, a woman named Mesem. Um, Can you tell us about her and what was she like? And how did she experience um, this dystopic future that you're talking about? Yes. So Mason was um, a young woman in her, uh, when I met her, she was in her late twenties living in Ankara, which is the capital of Turkey. Uh, she was a refugee. Uh, she had, she had just arrived in Turkey when I met her. Um, she was 
overcoming um, all kinds of psychological, you know, effects, depression, anxiety, uh, you know, that the Chinese state had sort of imparted on her as she left. Uh, Mason was just brilliantly smart, um, a, a literary intellectual who had read vast amounts of books and poetry, um, truly just a cosmopolitan woman of the world who had these dreams as a teenager of becoming a diplomat to represent China. Um, she came from an elite family, a uh, deeply patriotic family. Um, you know, she had graduated near the top of her class, had attended a, a very good university in Beijing, the capital, um, and really had things set out for her. But um, due to just, you know, the, the high nature of her intelligence and curiosity, the fact that she liked to read books, um, the fact that she was traveling, she was she had been studying for a master's degree in Turkey and lived in Turkey and returned to China every summer to be with her family. Uh, just those facts was enough as the surveillance state was set up for the AI system to locate her and to start watching her and to, to, to determine that she was someone who was not trustworthy, um, who might be harboring terrorist thoughts and who needed to be acted against and taken to indoctrination lessons first. So the AI identifies her, and we'll talk about how they did that in a moment, but what hap started happening once she was flagged? So a government minder started showing up at her uh, doorway every day and sometimes twice a day and would, uh, you know, knock on the door, would take a look around the home, ask her questions. So, you know, where were you? What did you do today? Did you see anything suspicious? Um, and then, you know, there was this little barcode on the door and, and the minder would scan it uh, to suggest that she had done her daily inspection and could go. So one day this minder showed up and uh, told her that there was an order from the police station that um, someone had either reported her or found suspicious activity related to what she was doing with her life, didn't give details, um, and handed her the instructions to install a government camera that would connect to local police stations in her living room. It was recording 24-7, watching them. Um, and, you know, this this was devastating to Mason because it essentially meant that, you know, all the, the private conversations, all the books that she was reading, uh, she could no longer read them. She could no longer do what she loved um, until she went back to Turkey. So this camera is there for a little while. Um, I believe it was maybe four or five weeks or so. And then finally... Uh, the local police said that, um, you know, you need to report here every few days. You're going to do an indoctrination lesson. They call it civics class. Uh, and it was a, she would have to go for interrogation. She would sit there in front of three police officers who sit at this one desk in front. And they just drill her on repetitive questions over and over again. Like, why do you go to Turkey? Do you know any terrorists in Turkey? Uh, do you read the Quran? Are you Muslim? What is your favorite Quran verse? And they would ask the same questions over and over in different forms just to throw her off and to make her paranoid and to make her nervous. And it's like, how do I answer? What if my answer changes? Um, and then finally, after these grueling interrogation classes, she, she was finally ordered just to go to uh, a series of concentration camps, two concentration camps, actually. First to one that was a lower level re-education center where she could leave at 6 p.m. every day. Um, but then within a few hours, she was kicked up to a top security compound, which is called a detention center. Uh, and she was forced to stay there and to undergo psychological and physical torture um, to erase her identity. And what, what, what did she go through there? So on her first day, she was she was required to uh, get in a tiger chair, which is this con it's it's this chair that contorts your legs and arms, and it's it's it's, it's very uncomfortable to sit in uh, for more than a few minutes. Uh, and and the the guards just put her out in the courtyard and you know left her there until her sun burns, you know. And then they would do things like uh, you know they would take her out of the chair and then you know make her uh, stand still, say on one leg, or like you know lift up her arms, like kind of lift her upper arms like this, uh, and just stand still for thirty minutes to. An hour, uh, and, and and an officer would stand behind her with a, a baton, uh, and if she moved or got uncomfortable or you know stopped, like put her leg down so she could stand on two legs, uh, the the officer would just start beating her, you know, until she got back in place. And they would do this. They would say like, oh, if you you know if we hit you, that means you have to start over. So they start the clock over. You got to do another hour, stand perfectly still in a weird position, uh, and it just would go. I mean, this would go on and on until finally she could do it. Um, 
So that's physical. I mean, that's physical, but there was also a lot of um, gaslighting kind of like, I, I guess what we would call in the West, like narcissistic gaslighting and like, you know, the denial of reality. This is one of the more bizarre tests that I've heard, but they would put out a table for a student and one side of the table would have like a, a home, like it would be like a model of a home and a yard and you're supposed to rearrange the car and the house and, and you know, everything according to what it would actually look like. And then next to that would be another table that would have like an AK-47 and a grenade and a, uh, a pistol and a rocket launcher. And they would tell you, you have to reorganize the, you know, the rocket launcher and the assault rifle. So like, it looks like it's in the correct arrangement on a table. And it's like- Little toy versions, right? And, it, and it's like, well, you know, what, like, what is the correct arrangement of an assault rifle on a table, a toy assault rifle? Um, and the, the secret answer to the test is that if you even touch them and try to move them, that means that you're comfortable around weapons and therefore you're a terrorist and they would put you in solitary confinement and torture you. So this is one example of the extreme psychological torture tactics that they use where it's like, it's, it's for Mason, it was very much a riddle and it was, we don't know where the line is drawn, what is permissible and what's not. And her story in the camp is going through this riddle and trying to figure out where is she, where is she crossing the line and doing something unacceptable? And it's never really a clear answer. That's, and that's how they drain you. That's how they indoctrinate you. So how is she able to get through this and then ultimately get out of escape China? So um, it turned out that there was a bureaucratic loophole. And one of the things you got to understand about, I call this, I call the book the perfect police state, but the irony of this perfect police state is that it, it, it has a lot of flaws and loopholes and imperfections, bureaucracy that um, ironically make it perfect. Because like, if the system is imperfect, that's why people are unsure of what to, to do. They don't know what's going to get them in trouble. They don't know even the AI system. They don't understand, like, how does it come to conclusions about people? But in Mason's case, um, you know, being the intelligent woman she is, she was able to locate some of these loopholes and exploit them in a way with the help of her mom to get out. I mean, you got to understand just how lucky she was with that timing. If she had stayed any longer, she probably would still be there. Um, but it was just really good luck good timing, um, being intelligent, knowing the right people that got her out when she did. After this, in so just, just to finish off here, in, um, in late 2016, right after she had left, the government began ordering Uyghurs to report to local police stations and they would have to surrender their passports. So it's, it was impossible, almost impossible um, to get out. So, you know, she's very lucky. And you mentioned the the crudeness almost of the infrastructure. And it's, it really struck me reading through this, that this narrative of it being a per perfect police state that can target with high specificity and accuracy actually seems fundamentally off, right? Like it isn't that, but it is, it might be perfect for a genocide. I mean, exactly. it's, it's good. It's very good at doing what it does but it is not targeted. I mean, if this was actually looking for terrorists, she would not have been included in this targeting, right? So it, it shows maybe the intent is different than the characterization. Exactly, that's exactly what it is. It's a crude system that is designed to keep people on their toes to, you know, turn them against each other. If I, you know, if there's a divide and conquer here, so like, you know, if my, good friend might be snitching on me. Well, I'm going to snitch on him first and hopefully he'll be taken to a camp. And then my ranking with the government rises and maybe the AI and the computer systems won't, you know, won't take me away. Maybe I'll be okay in the end, but that's rarely how it works because even if you snitch on your friend, like the AI is just going to find you guilty anyway. Even if you're a member of the party and you have good standing with the government, none of that matters anymore. And it's just anyone can go for any reason. So it works. It works at that objective, which makes you me wonder um, or be even more concerned about our adoption of similar technologies for supposedly much more precise policing operations, if they're actually designed for much broader, cruder psychological warfare <laughs> purposes. Um, can they even be calibrated for the purposes with which we are using them or claim to use them now? 
Um, yeah, yeah. Our law enforcement um, agencies in the West are deploying the same technologies. I mean, we're we're using facial recognition. We're using AI to predict, um, you know, na- who who's going to commit a crime, neighborhoods that might commit a crime. But the problem is that there's not much transparency around how these systems work. Um, police departments, by their nature, are not transparent. And we don't know if they're gathering good data. I mean, is the data even that worthwhile? Um, is this garbage in, garbage out? You know, is the software that good? Um, you know, the software is proprietary. So, like, I mean, I, like, we can't lift up the hood and, and check, like, is it actually doing its job? Like, there are lots and lots of questions over, you know, whether this technology is actually useful in the U.S. I mean, I guess broadly you describe three components of this kind of perfect surveillance state. Um, can you can you run through what what's needed to do this on the tech end? Yes, this is something that I did not. Um, I, I guess I didn't analyze this myself or think of this myself. This is actually something that a Uyghur friend told me uh, who who is still in Xinjiang, and uh, you know, I just I really hope that. He's been okay since I, I last saw him in December 2017, um, you know, but so there's no way to know. But he told me up front what was going on. Um, so there, there were three stages that he observes. So one stage is that you need to um, find a way to, uh, I guess that you could say divide and conquer your people. You need to uh, first find a way to surveil them in a way that breaks down trust. And that could mean putting out fake news, social media, anger, just look for cracks in the population and drive wedges into those cracks so that people no longer want to work together and they're angry and hostile and they're they're worried about um, what's happening. Um, then you want to find ways to exploit private companies that are either you know, a they're worried about their profits. They're having you know hard times. They're they're in debt. They're investing a lot of money in future tech that might um, you know might not come to fruition. And you know, find ways to subsidize those companies or work with them or help them. And then on the flip end, um, you know, if there are companies that are doing well, they don't want to you know they're going to be complacent. They don't want to uh, you know mess up the success they built. And you know, they'll work with the authorities if the authorities come knocking and say like, look, we want your you know we want your back doors into your iPhone or your smartphones or that sort of thing. Um, So co-opting private companies, making them essentially arms of the state is is another um, popular tactic. Um, And then the third stage is when uh, the government uh, creates what this Uyghur person told me is the panopticon. So the idea is that, you know, everyone knows that they're being watched, but they don't know when or how um, or why, or with what methods. But since it's a panopticon, I mean, nobody knows for sure if- If it's working or not. I mean, that's- Yeah, just, if it's working or not. If, and, you know, is, is there, like, you never know. Like, so for example, is there a huge, so there's this talk of, you know, the, the human behind the, you know, the AI curtain, you know, like the Wizard of Oz, you just, you open the curtain and actually it doesn't work at all. And there's just a human there running it all. It could be just that a police officer is sitting there and says, well, today I'm going to look at, you know, Mr. Wong and what he's doing. And he's just, you know, following your internet to, connection and looking at your messages and that's that and then you're going to jail and that's classic orwellian surveillance implications that is. right is nobody knows if they're being watched if everybody thinks they are um so in order to do this though it seems like a number of technologies needed to come to development there's a technological capacity that wouldn't have existed 10 years ago to do what's possible now and it, I mean, you describe it as having this data component that comes from the control of social platforms and all the communication that happens and information that's shared on social platforms, as well as the data that can be captured through surveillance cameras and networks of surveillance cameras. You also needed technology to make sense of all those data, because this is obviously, if you're capturing all conversations of all people in a country of over a billion people, that's a lot of data. Um, so you need the AI, and in particular, the kind of facial recognition technology, audio recognition technology built on AI to make sense of it. And then you need this whole layer of like interpreting it that was this whole kind of social credit system, this scoring system that like actually judged people based on these data. And it, what's really struck me about that characterization of this infrastructure was that the state couldn't do it alone. They needed innovation. 
I was fascinated by your descriptions between Huawei, for example, and the state or the emergence of WeChat as a, as a network um, and the relationship it had with the state. And like, can you describe a bit how these companies that are now massive global companies, often trying to go public on foreign exchanges even, um, were part of building this apparatus and actually benefited from building this surveillance apparatus? Yeah, so these these companies started out on their own. I mean, they were startups. They didn't. They were scrappy. Um, you know, they a lot of these companies would just copy technologies from America, the European Union. Uh, I mean, th there wasn't really much to look at twenty years ago when it came to Chinese technology, but it was with the support of the state and with the party to um, build a massive technological industry, and within that, in particular, a massive, um, just colossal and a uh, sophisticated software infrastructure that existed only within China and was sort of unique to China was really the way that China was able to set up this surveillance. Um, so, you know, this project really, I, I would pinpoint the beginning of it to 2005, which is when China set up a, a, an umbrella system that it calls Skynet, which is the same, or Tianwan in Chinese, which is the same uh, name as the you know Terminator computer system that starts a nuclear war and kills everyone. Um, so the idea was to eventually bring together all these Chinese companies that were innovating in AI and smartphones and and systems networks. So Huawei, for example, um, you know, also taking um, you know finding ways, finding incentives to bring uh, Chinese researchers who had graduated from places like Stanford and MIT or had gone through Microsoft Research Asia, um, and finding ways to to incentivize them to bring them together under a government supervised umbrella um, because the government could not do this by itself. Um, but it was, you know, the, the Chinese state led efforts to improve VC, to, you know, give out venture capital, um, to fund these companies. So this was uh, a long project, but I think that the big moment the Chinese executives tell me about um, was in 2017 uh, when the AI system AlphaGo, which was made by uh, DeepMind, which is owned by Google, defeated the Chinese world champion, uh, Ke Jie. And once he lost, that was the moment when China's leaders realized that they were far behind, um, you know, what, that they had a Sputnik moment and that they had to catch up to American technologies. And a lot of Chinese tech executives told me since then that that was really the turning point um, when the money started coming in, the military connections, the interest in what they were doing. And that was when China passed legislation to that allowed um, all these software eco ecosystems to come together into one. So, you know, WeChat would provide data on people's purchases and messages, and Weibo had their searches, MIGV had their facial recognition, Huawei had their smartphones and their tapping, their usage. Um, these all came together and these all helped create this surveillance state in Xinjiang where everyone just had all the data just, just scooped up into this AI system. That was what was necessary to create this. So I, just to push on that piece, I mean, I personally find this is a very difficult topic to learn about because there is so much just, I mean, one, there's just all sorts of just barriers to understanding this system, but there just isn't a lot of research done in an open way about how the system worked, um, or, nor a ton of journalism on it. And one of the real ambiguities you consistently hear is what happens to this? So is it the case that all data collected by all Chinese tech companies ends up somewhere on a Chinese server or flowing through a Chinese state server of some sort? Is, is, it, is it that visceral or is it more just sort of coordination between these entities at various moments? I, yeah, I think it's more coordination between these various entities. So I did interview a Uyghur um, technology worker who was in, who, he was directly involved in setting up these exact same surveillance apparatuses in Xinjiang until 2015. And, you know, he talked about how the requirement to making this work was building an algorithm or an AI system that could pull all these strands together and look at the facial recognition, look at the voice recognition, look at the WeChat messages, um, and just, just gather as much data as possible and, and scoop it up and find those correlations to predict the pre-crimes. 
But the thing is, is that, I mean, he talked about how simple, you know, just simplistic and, and terrible the system was at the beginning. Like, he said that for a long time, there wasn't really a government effort to use everyone, like every company together, but they would target one app, for example. And one app that they targeted was WeChat. They had obtained, uh, at one point, starting in 2013, every single, um, like, every single message sent between anyone in the Xinjiang region, uh, it would be stored on government databases for two years at that point. And, and then they, they experimented with new, with new AI developments and they, they would tell the AI to, you know, look for words like bomb and gun and Quran, religion, Muslim. And then the AI would just determine that someone was, you know, was a terrorist threat based on, you know, some words that they had used. So I think that for a long time, the system has been more, um, kind of slipshod and maybe helter skelter than was always anticipated. You know, I, I didn't see much evidence from him that the the unifying umbrella really came until later with the the AlphaGo victories and, and all that stuff. Um, it was really kind of just like, you know, arbitrary and, you know, today we're going to do this, tomorrow we're going to do that. Let's just patch it together and see what works. And, and in this patchwork, it is not just... Chinese technologies that are being used, um, but there are American and Western technologies being deployed both in a number of ways. And it seems to me there's a there's a element you describe elements of complicity here. One being the building of technologies themselves that some of these com Western companies have built that are being used in this way um, in China. There are companies that acquiesce to Chinese state demands in order to get access to the market in China. Um, in some way, that breeds a complicity. Um, but also just where all this technology is built is often built on the backs of forced labor coming from weaker populations moved out into forced labor camps. I mean, how would you characterize this, the culpability of, a, of Western technologies and companies in all of this? This, this is a problem of globalization. This is the the underbelly of the narrative that I think we were all sold that globalization is going to open societies and open governments and the new middle class is going to demand liberal reforms and um, all these you know all these broad statements that have been um, discredited for many years now um, that are essentially the work of people who stand to profit from selling these narratives. Um, so this is it's fundamentally a problem that um, many American companies, uh, Apple included, uh, various garment companies, um, some German auto companies were caught with their pants down in Xinjiang. You know, they they enthusiastically went into China thinking that this was going to be the, the future, the economic center of gravity. Um, but uh, they did they did it fully knowing that there was a colossal risk that they were going to be directly involved in the trading and supplying and purchase of goods built with slave labor or built under severely repressed uh, conditions and human rights abuses. Um, so uh, what happened is that the, the world in China started tethering them together and now they're all tethered at the hip economically. Um, and, and then after that happened, China set up many of these Uyghur slave labor programs in which people would go to camps and they would be discharged after a little while. And the government would say, all right, we're going to teach you a vocation. So we're going to put you in what they call a vocational training center. And you can spend a few months to a few years just doing free slave labor. Um, you know, one of the terrible realities of slavery is that it's extremely lucrative because you have an entire workforce that's just, you know, your profits are going to go up. It's certainly not sustainable. And now, uh, you know, all these companies from America and elsewhere that had, you know, opened their manufacturing there uh, have been just caught with their pants down and they're saying like, oh, oh, shoot. So, you know, I've actually had conversations with many of them where their public relations departments um, will, you know, say that they didn't realize that there was slave labor or they didn't know that that could happen. You know, they, they essentially say this is not our problem and this is not something we knew about. Um, but the thing is that, 
They did know. I mean, when they opened, you know, when they opened manufacturing centers in China, they they did know what was going on. They did have due diligence that suggested, you know, we might have slave labor. We might have it could be anything. I mean, not just slave labor, but intellectual property theft, major risk. And now it's happening. Um, you know, people are going to counterfeit our goods. Um, this is, you know, this is just simply how the Chinese government operates. And this is not something that they're going to change that easily. And you know, now these companies are having to grapple with uh, poor decisions that they. They made many years ago. I mean, you talk a lot in the book about this kind of cold war that's emerging, and I think that that's maybe one narrative. Um, but it seems to me there there's something else going on in terms of both the Belt and Road Initiative, but also the Digital Silk Road that kind of is a part of that, where some of these this capacity um, to either control citizens or survey citizens or that capability is being exported to often to a liberal leaning regimes who may find that set of tools quite attractive. Do you draw that connection? Do you are you concerned about the the use of these technologies in a liberal leaning regimes or democracies that are backsliding? Um, and, and if that's the case, there, I mean, this is a much bigger story. This is not just about the persecution of a minority inside China. This could be about the state of democracy globally. Um, are you concerned about that broader context? Uh, yes, I am. I'm, I'm very concerned. And that's actually um, my intention in writing the book. I realized early on that this is not just a story about one minority in China that, you know, has 12 million people living there. That's a very small part of China, which is, you know, more than 1 billion people. Uh, this is a story about humanity. You know, this is a story about what happens when we put um, bad technologies in the hands of bad people who have bad intentions, you know, without oversight, without uh, laws, without democracy, checks and balances. Um, it's really a story about the worst that can happen uh, in a an authoritarian regime that wants to wipe out a population, um, you know, not necessarily through old school genocide tactics, not through the gas chambers and the mass graves, uh, but through the subtle and slow burn of, you know, erasing their thoughts and who they are and, and forcibly sterilizing the women so they can't have babies and, and all, you know, all these sinister tactics that are now being deployed in Xinjiang. So uh, yes, you know, it's a book about humanity, um, and one of the things uh, that deeply concerns me that I also wrote about in the book was uh, the export of Chinese surveillance technologies to regimes around the world. Um, you know, they see huge potential in using Chinese technologies to, uh, you know, direct traffic in their cities and, and solve crimes and, you know, the usual, the smart cities, the safe cities. Um, th this is the, the story that they've been sold. But the other side to that, as we're now seeing, is that um, you know, these technologies are extremely useful for dictators and tyrants, um, especially in, in, in parts of Africa, parts of South America, um, and parts of the Middle East, um, to, you know, to, just to make it easier to control their people, to know what their people are doing and to spy on them. Yeah, I mean, I, I God, I agree. I share that concern that that's, that's the slide we're seeing here. And it's a slide that is obviously caused by many things, um, but a reversing of of certain democratic progress that's been made globally over the last 30 years is I think a real reality right now. And it's in part enabled by these, by these technologies. And you, I mean, you mentioned the sort of Orwellian nature of this and it, you end, you end um, the book sort of arguing that look like we can't say what if anymore, we have to say that this is what's happening um, in some very real ways and acknowledge that um, and now ask what we should do about it instead. Um, and so I, I guess I just end with that is, is what do you think we should be doing about it? You know, there's no easy answer, because we still don't know a ton about, you know, how these technologies work, there's still so much opacity around them. I think this is one of the, this is one of the side effects of, you know, the pace of technological change that we've seen is that we need, we now are in a, I think, in a phase in human history, when we're going to be for the next, you know, for sort for, for the foreseeable future, we're going to be playing 
uh, a catch up so that you know our social norms and our laws and the way we govern ourselves is caught up with the pace of technology you know, the pace of change in technology that's happened in the past 20 30 years so uh, i mean you know one thing we could do i i think that so many of these problems come from um, a lack of transparency and i would be in favor of a new system of copyright or trademark or trade secrets um, that, you know, maybe, you know, requires the public to have some level of access to something that would, you know, have enormous consequences for the public squares. Uh, you know, like, I, the, these companies cannot be treated as completely private, you know, if, if our society and our democracy is, con- is to continue flourishing. So, you know, maybe one solution um, would be, uh, you know, th- this would be a little more radical and I think would get opposition, but some kind of partial nationalization of big social media companies, not just breaking them up, but, um, you know, ensuring that, uh, you know, maybe local governments or local authorities have a partial stake in these companies and are able to vote in shareholder resolutions and able to push things in the interest of the people. Um, in America, we already, in Canada too, that we already have pension funds that are major, you know, activist investors in, um, in companies trying to reform their activities, but it's not enough yet. And there needs to be more kind of corporate governance overseeing them. I'm really glad you raise the things we can do in our own societies to make our own technology more accountable as part of a solution to this broader problem that you've identified in the Chinese use of these technologies. Because... One of the most common narratives you're hearing from Silicon Valley now is like, look, regulation will limit our our ability to compete with these Chinese, unencumbered Chinese companies. Um, And uh, it seems to me that that argument is precisely the the wrong one. Um, That really, if, if we care about making these technologies more democratic, we should do that here and maybe show that these companies and these technologies can be governed in a way that preserve human rights and democratic principles. And maybe that's the way into this broader narrative that often bifurcates Chinese and, and Western technologies. That we figure out how to how to govern our own and, and show that that's possible. Yes, I agree completely. I think that you just hit it right on the head. Um, you know, I think that there is misplaced hype over Chinese technology in America. We, you know, I think that in North America, we have this perception that um, oh the Chinese they they have great schools and their kids are mastering math and becoming you know world class scientists and uh, you know they're catching up quickly they're going to overtake America they're going to beat America obviously this has inklings of the the Cold War mindset with the Soviet Union you know China is I think today a much more technologically sophisticated power than the USSR ever was but still um, I didn't find a ton of evidence from my own reporting and research that China is you know some kind of like dominant master of technology that's going to um, take over the world. We should be concerned, of course, but America always, you know, America and the West uh, has a strong lead already. I mean, you know, the the West has companies uh, like Ericsson and Nokia um, that are building, you know, major 5G systems. We already have a lead. And, you know, if like if we're going to give up our lead to the, these authoritarian tendencies that companies have the final say over the future of our democracy, um, the companies are going to be making technology in their interests and not in the interests of a society. Um, and that's that's going to end up hampering our society at large. I mean, that, that's when technology is actually a burden on us. We need to make sure that technology is uplifting us and making us, you know, making us improve in ways that we should be improving. That was my conversation with Jeffrey Kane. As always, I'd love to hear from you. Email me at taylor at bigtechpodcast.com. Big Tech is presented by the Center for International Governance Innovation and produced by Antica Productions. Please consider subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We release new episodes on Thursdays every other week.